Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of making a murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello everybody, just wanted to upload a little video here today, this morning here, um, about, you know, a little clip from the on-bank review, something that kind of always bothered me, so I wanted to kind of just isolate it and show everybody. Uh, what you're going to see here is is Laura Nyrider arguing about the fact that the, the idiom of the truth shall set you free uh, was understood by Brendan as a promise, like if he, he understood that as if he told them whatever they accepted as the truth, that he would be able to go free. And, and that's the way he interpreted it, because he's not able to understand idioms, or he wasn't at the time when he was 16. And so she's arguing, and she's arguing with Supreme Court law, that precedent that backs that up, and that sort of stuff. And it's interesting. So she's going through that, and how the Supreme Court backs that up, that that, 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 that they're, you know, and she talks a lot about how it's, the Supreme Court has deemed that <clears throat> whether or not, um, uh, confession, uh, you know, whether or not tactics in, in, um, interrogation tactics are, are enough to overbear a will is very, very, you know, specific to each individual suspect and that Brendan Dassey had a unique set of, 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 you know, factors involved that made him very suggestible. It made him where he, he didn't really understand things like idioms. So he didn't understand that to be a meta, you know, like a, just a saying that the truth will set you free. He he took that to mean that they were telling him, if, you know, if, if you tell us what we accept as the truth, then you'll go free. That's kind of the way he would have, you know, eventually interpreted it. So she's talking about how the Supreme Court says it's different uh, and, it's, and it's, it's an individual thing with each individual suspect. She's making her case how the Supreme Court has basically, you know, reasoned that, you know, this, this, you know, type of thing shouldn't, you know, can happen, right? And so, so that's what she's arguing. Then Judge Hamilton, well, then Judge Hamilton says, okay, so look, if we were to grant your habeas relief here, you know, or whatever, she's like, he says, what practical advice would you offer investigators moving forward? Okay, this is like, we're in hypothetical land, right? And yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and start playing the clip and I might jump in here and there. But in particular, his impairment's undisputed record that he was unable to process idioms. Combine that, that statement that honesty will set you free with the That's assurance. Not true. I'm sorry? That's not true? That statement was not true, Your Honor. Certainly not. And you see him believing, of course, that it will be true because you see him expecting after confessing to rape and murder. Okay. <laughs> that, that guy asking, you know, is, is, that's not true right there? That's Judge Ken. That's the guy who you hear me refer to as like the sleeping grandpa who wakes up to yell at the kids to get off of his lawn. Yeah, that's him right there saying, you know, when she says, you know, the truth will set you free. And he, he asks, that's not true? I mean, <laughs> no, that's not true. It's not. Literally, it's not true. Maybe it might be spiritually. You know, there might be an argument for it spiritually, but but in the real physical world... You know, Brendan, if he tells what the investigators are willing to accept as truth, if he tells that, he's not going to be free. So absolutely not. It wouldn't be a true statement in any way, shape, or form. So I don't understand why he has so much trouble with this concept, but he, that, he that's not the only time he's going to ask. He's going to, he's, I mean, it's, I swear, I think maybe his mind is starting to go, folks. I truly believe that Judge Can is maybe getting a little too old to be on the bench anymore. I think he, he just gets to like stuck in a loop of repeating himself and stuff. It's really odd. So anyway, we'll go back to the clip. That he's going to go back to school. And even after the officers disabuse him of that notion, they say to him, Brendan, you know, we're police officers, right? And because of what you said, the law won't let us let you go. 
he still clings to that illusion and he says is it only for one well, day he, even if they attempted to correct him then it's still wrong honesty will not set him free that's even correct if they, even if the police attempted to correct his misunderstanding it's that doesn't do any good they only attempted to correct that misunderstanding after he confessed when they finally break the promise and my colleague on the other side for the state of wisconsin spoke to brendan's demeanor after the officers told him that they were going to arrest spoke to the fact that at that moment the first thing he did was ask for his mother at that moment he began to weep why only then because that's the moment the bargain was broken for him that's the what moment bargain? he understood what bargain that honesty and repeating back the story that the officers gave him would set him free so so there was a bargain so you see what i mean with this guy so there was a bargain and she's like yeah you know explains and then he goes so so there was a bargain like i mean it's just like what dude judge can what's wrong dude are you stuck in a feedback loop or something? It's just like, oh my God. Anyway, moving on. There was a bargain, Your Honor. Repeat back the, the story that we want to hear, and in exchange, you will be set free. It was a bargain that was understood as such because of Brendan Dassey's limitations, which is precisely what the Supreme Court has directed us to do, to define coercion in terms of how a reasonable person in that suspect's position would have perceived. And that's because of his lower IQ. And his impairments and his disabilities and his age. Yes, Your Honor. And the fact that he is 95% more suggestible than the population. That's exactly right. So some people could have a psychological condition of suggestibility and be older or have a higher IQ and other people. These are, I think this is a totality point that you're making. And in Gallegos and other cases, the Supreme Court has told us, you know, not to get too if you will, siloed in our thinking about this, that Brendan is uh, of lower intelligence or that he's this or he's that. It's, he's a package. And so I want to ask you um, whether you think the correct legal inquiry is whether a reasonable person, a reasonable functioning adult, would have found this interrogation uh, coercive or if we're supposed to take all aspects of Brendan as an individual and ask that question. We are to take all aspects of Brendan's personal characteristics into account. And what's your best case for that, that this is not something that's just an objective standard? Yarborough versus Alvarado directs the litigants and the courts to examine the actual mindset of the suspect in a voluntariness case in opposition to the objective Miranda custody inquiry. And this court has said in multiple places, including U.S. versus Sturdivant, that the inquiry is whether a reasonable person in the defendant's shoes would have been coerced, which is of a piece with a long-standing line of Supreme Court case law. Haley versus Ohio would not exist if we were to judge all interrogation tactics against the will of an adult. Haley tells us the opposite. That which would leave a man cold and unimpressed can overawe and overwhelm a child. And that's what you see on this tape. There are so, so, Ms. Nareeder, the um, the police need to take account of all circumstances, right? Um, the police rarely will have access to a full psychological background, school records, and all the information that's been used to challenge the voluntariness of this confession. Um, they simply deal with the first witness and then later suspect uh, that they're dealing with without all that background information. If we were to affirm the grant of habeas relief in this case, which you've described as unique, um, what practical advice would you give to police about what is and is not permissible in interrogating a high school boy who's not very quick okay so remember what i said about hypothetical land folks here we go i would say your honor that taking this case as an example these interrogators knew at the least that he was 16 years old based on their interactions on february 27th they also had at least some reason to believe he might be limited he wasn't able to spell agent 
or detective. So what should they do? So what should they do? What can they do to solve the crime? They may still question him. There's no doubt about that. But they can't say things. They may, as long as it doesn't overbear his will. But they cannot say things that will land on this defendant as a promise. They should never say things like, I'm a cop, but I'm not right now. I'm a parent, when you've got a 16-year-old in the interrogation room. They shouldn't say things like, we know you're scared of arrest, but you've got nothing to worry about. Everything will be all right. You're creating new law now. There is no case that says that. And we're here on 2254D review. A federal court cannot create new law on habeas review. And that's what you're asking for in this case. It's just flatly impermissible under all the Supreme Court's precedents. No, Judge Sykes. Uh, She's not asking for new law. She was answering the very hypothetical question that was asked by your fellow majority judge, Hamilton. So what it looks like is, is you and Hamilton got together and agreed for him to do the little set while you could spike when she actually answered his hypothetical question. That's what it looks like, personally. But, you know, maybe that's what you learned over there in the Wisconsin Supreme Court. I don't know. But anyway. Your Honor, I am not asking for the creation of new law. I'm asking for this court to apply decades old law. You're identifying criteria and things that the cops cannot do. There is no case that says they cannot do those things. I am not asking this Your court has to use this case to establish that new benchmark for investigators in interrogating juveniles. There is no case law to support that under established law under 2254D you must lose. Let me be very, very clear. I am not asking for this court to erect a rule that anything the officers said will always be proscribed for going forward. Aren't you focusing, I mean, that's why I want to come back to 2254-D-2, because that's a very factually bound circumstance, and it's the decision um, based on all of the evidence that with this package of facts, the finding that this was a voluntary uh, confession was um, not even a possible finding uh, on this record. That doesn't create new law. The Supreme Court just now in Brumfield, two years ago, to be uh, accurate, 2015, says um, that the 2254D inquiry asks you to look at an unreasonable determination of the facts. Isn't that what you're following? That is exactly what we're following, Your Honor. This is a very fact-bound case, and there was an unreasonable determination in the facts in this case. And I would also imagine that the facts in this case are unlikely to recur. Which fact-finding do you take issue with? I take issue with the state court's finding that there were no promises of leniency made to this defendant, which is what the district court identified as a D2 error. Well, that's asking for new law because you're asking for us to hold that this biblical quote is beyond the pale and no reasonable judge could disagree with that. That is asking for new law, by definition, because no court says that. I am asking for this court to apply Miller versus Fenton, which both, says... Both the state courts, though, the trial court and the appellate court, specifically acknowledge the statement, the general, you know, the, the, the truth, honesty will set you free. They both acknowledge that point, right? They did, Your Honor. So, obviously, didn't think that was a sufficiently specific or legally relevant promise of leniency. Is that a fair reading of uh, of what they said? Yes, and that's the unreasonable application of law and the unreasonable finding of fact. Fact or law? Well, Your Honor, the district court treated it as a D2 fact, following Sharp versus Rowling in the Tenth Circuit, which did the same thing. But whether it's treated under D2 or D1, I think we are left with the ultimate conclusion being the same. Isn't the the D as I see it anyway? Maybe this is too literal. The D1 aspect of this is whether, in the end, this was a voluntary confession. The Supreme Court has said that that question raises a question of law uh, because it's a constitutional fact, sort of, but it's assessed as a matter of law. The D2 question is the more granular one. Looking at all of these transcripts, are, are there one or more promises of leniency? Uh, should you look at this this way? And the court has said 
as far back as the terry williams against taylor case that the facts don't need to be an exact map you're going to look at these promises and see whether they actually amount to a promise of lenience that's exactly right your honor and the court has reiterated that more recently in panetti versus quarterman and marshall versus rogers clearly established federal law may be found in general principles we need not identify a case with factual identity at a high level of specificity so another case could come along when somebody would say you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and that would not be a promise of lenience i would imagine for most people that would not be a promise of leniency that's correct Mm -hmm. exactly right so there's no automatic character to the rule if it's a d2 problem was this a promise or was this not a promise there is no automatic character we must not evaluate these tactics in isolation the supreme court directs us to do otherwise they must be evaluated in conjunction with the package of brendan dassey's vulnerabilities all right so there you have it i mean i think ultimately even though what hamilton and sykes kind of pulled there i feel was very disingenuous uh you know it really looked like it, you know, like they thought this was a volleyball game, and and Hamilton went up and did the set, while you know Sykes came up and you know spiked it, right? Anyway, and it was just a dirty trick. It's just yeah, again another thing about the on bank majority that is just strikes me as disingenuous. Uh, you all know how I love that word. So anyway, so that was that that was the clip of you know the on bank review. I wanted to share with everybody here, kind of isolate. I may isolate some other ones here coming in the near future. So anyway, that's about it for today. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and we'll see you.